Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to um, Palliative Care and Geriatric Grand Rounds at Mass General. For those of you who don't know about our um, fellowship, we're an interprofessional fellowship, and we're delighted to really represent that today with an interprofessional presentation. And so um, uh, Zena is one of our pediatric physician fellows, and Lauren is one of our pediatric social work fellows, and their um, work, uh, spend their clinical time at Children's um, on the Pediatric Advanced Care Team, or PACT team. Um, and so Zena uh, received her bachelor's degree from Columbia and also went on to attend medical school at Columbia, uh, where she completed her scholarly project within the medical education track. She moved to Boston to be a resident at Children's Hospital and then went on to be a chief resident at Children's Hospital. Um, and this year she is one of our um, pediatric palliative care fellows. Um, she's interested in exploring the incorporation of palliative care principles into general pediatrics and finding ways to use medical education to enhance communication in healthcare, particularly between healthcare providers and families of pediatric patients with life altering and life limiting diagnoses. Um, and Lauren Kramer completed her um, undergraduate degree in social work and psychology at um, Providence College. She then completed a master's in social work and a certified graduate study program in children and adolescent trauma at Rhode Island College School of Social Work. Her professional interests uh, include providing trauma-informed care to children, adolescents, and their families affected by complex medical conditions as well as grief and loss. So welcome, Lauren and Zena. Good morning. Um, thanks, Kathleen. Uh, I'm Zena. Uh, as Kathleen said, I'm one of the physician fellows in the pediatrics track of the fellowship. And my name's Lauren Kramer. I am the social work fellow with the Pediatric Advanced Care team this year. And we're really excited to be here this morning to tell you about palliating the perspective. Applying the principles of narrative medicine, narrative ethics, and narrative therapy to reframe the narrative of the bereaved. Neither of us have any industry relationships to disclose. And after this talk, we hope that you'll be able to list the modifiable factors related to prolonged grief disorder. Define narrative medicine, narrative ethics, and narrative therapy. Identify the ways in which these fields relate to palliative care. And ultimately, reflect on how techniques from these fields could enhance your communication with patients, families, and clinicians in your future work. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that prolonged grief disorder is a problem. And although there are many terms used to describe this bereavement experience marked by an intrusive yearning and defined by a number of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral symptoms, literature indicates that it affects greater than 20% of all bereaved individuals. And throughout the course of this presentation, we'll be uh, using a lot of qualitative data in an effort to highlight the voices of bereaved parents to emphasize the different um, things that we're going to be talking about. Um, and though we're both pediatric clinicians, mm -hmm. our hope is by hearing these voices, you might be able to think about non-pediatric patients that you've cared for in the past, as a lot of the themes really resound with mm -hmm. all types of bereaved individuals. So this quote from a qualitative study, and that definitely is a journey and it's never ending. And I don't expect it will ever end. You know, my grief is only seven and a half years old. I don't expect when I'm 85 that all of a sudden I'm going to be okay that my son died. I expect that I'm going to probably at 85 miss him so much more and can hardly wait because I know the time's getting closer when I see him again, you know? And fortunately, um, we know that bereavement risk can be predictive. Um, and we compiled a list of risk and protective factors based on an intensive literature review um, specific to parental bereavement. But as Zena shared, um, we feel that a lot of these um, factors um, can be applicable to adult providers as well, specifically caregivers and healthcare proxies. And in looking through these factors, we identified six which are modifiable that can impact um, the bereavement course. The first is feeling prepared for the child or loved one's death. 
having security in your role as a caregiver or feeling like a good parent? Finding meaning in the life of the child and their death. Feeling confident in the decisions, both medical and not medical decisions that they've made on behalf of the child. Parents having trust in the medical teams caring for their child at the end of life. And the way in which they perceive the minutes and the moment of death and whether they perceive it to be difficult or peaceful. Mm -hmm. And what we found in looking at these six factors um, is that they're all quite subjective. They have mm -hmm. something in common. Um, they are all a part of the patient's narrative and more specifically, how it's perceived by the bereaved, which is influenced by emotional impressions that they've accumulated throughout the course of the illness trajectory of their loved one. So, uh, and these are things that we see every, every day in, in our clinical work. Um, for example, a clinician saying to a parent, you did the right thing will instill pride and confidence in that parent and help them feel secure in their role as a caregiver and feel like a good parent. And someone from the medical team saying, that's a really good question to a parent during a team and family meeting, um, will ensure feelings of gratitude and safety, um, instilling trust in the medical team on behalf of the family. Or someone saying to a parent, I'm glad you brought him in. Um, that helps a parent feel reassured and uh, avoids regret in the decisions that they've made, uh, which allows them to feel confident in the decisions that they've made in the past and those moving forward. And someone saying, I will always remember this about your child, will instill feelings of legacy and mission in the parents as they hope to find meaning in their child's end of life as well as their death. And offering prognostic information mm -hmm. that is uh, empathetic and somewhat accurate, you know, in words like ours today's, that can provide parents with understanding and with courage mm -hmm. uh, to feel prepared and to get, get prepared for the impending death. And lastly, a care team member saying he or she looks so comfortable um, to the parents as they're witnessing the child's last moments will instill feelings of love, trust, and strength um, in their perception of that child's moment of death. And just as hard as all clinicians work to try and instill positivity in these subjective factors, um, these, the, the narrative itself is quite fragile and well-intentioned things can cause a negative impact as well. For example, a medical student or a resident coming into the room and sharing, wait, we can try one more medication or uh, aunt coming to visit with the family saying, you know, maybe this wouldn't have happened if you had just done this, brought him in sooner. Mm -hmm. And a well-meaning nurse saying to the family, this chest x-ray doesn't explain his respiratory failure. So comments like this, uh, when a parent or a loved one is in the process of um, gaining or having understanding of an illness course and why the narrative is the way it is. Um, this is, can sort of take that foundation away um, and create a situation in which um, both the team and or the family um, are searching for ways to make sense of it. Um, and that can cause conflicting perspectives as they both get caught up in the details of the case. In other words, when they can't see the forest for the trees. And we're going to be using this image throughout our presentation today um, as a storytelling tool to demonstrate. And as you can see here, when the family is stuck in the details, when the team is stuck in the details, or as Zena just said, stuck within the trees. Um, and then we'll be using this image again to show when the teams and the families are able to take a step back with support from the palliative care clinicians and being able to see the full forest. Um, or as Zena said again, regaining the big picture perspective and focusing on the child and goal-directed care. Because it's only then when both the family and the team are able to align in the goal-directed care mm -hmm. that the narrative can be maintained in a protective format. And this is a huge role for palliative care clinicians. 
because at any stage of a patient's illness trajectory, palliative care holds that narrative and reminds both the families and the teens of the big picture, aligning their perspectives with their goals. And what we've learned throughout this year as fellows um, is a common approach. Uh, we've learned this both in, in our didactics as well as in the clinical, uh, in the clinical world um, from the interdisciplinary members of the pediatric advanced care team. And so none of, not, uh, all of these steps uh, individually are things that we all know well. Um, but our hope is by putting each of them in the framework of these four steps, that it might offer you a different way of thinking about it. So the first step is learning the narrative of the family, of the team, and not just you know learning it, but hearing it for what it is. And the second step is understanding the caregivers or parents' decision-making process. And the third is helping aligning with the narrative um, and helping the caregivers to reframe their perspective uh, in an effort to help it be protective. And lastly, step four is preserving the protective narrative. Um, and this can be done both as a child approaches their end of life and then following which with ongoing bereavement support. And what we realized in thinking through these four steps is that each of them pulls from other disciplines um, that can actually help guide the work that we do. So learning the narrative, hearing the narrative, um, we can learn from principles of narrative medicine in how to do that better. And if we're looking to step two, understanding decision-making, um, we can apply principles that come from narrative ethics. And reframing the perspective as well as preserving and maintaining the narrative. Um, those are both, uh, those are both uh, skills that we can use principles of narrative therapy to improve upon. And through our presentation today, we're going to be demonstrating um, these different disciplines in the four step through a three case series. Um, so our first case today is going to be the case of AA. And though we'll be talking again about pediatric patients, our hope is that you'll use these cases to reflect on a case that you've seen recently or in the past um, and think about how each of these steps applies to your patient population. And with this case, uh, we'll be discussing narrative medicine for step one, um, and who better to uh, teach us all about narrative medicine than Rita Sharon, who's an attending at Columbia University, uh, who helped develop the field. So my, my colleagues and I at Columbia kind of invented or created a field that we call narrative medicine, which we define very simply as clinical practice fortified by the knowledge of what to do with stories. So that with these skills in, first of all, having a sense of story, and then being able to recognize when someone is telling you a story, to absorb the story, to receive it whole, to receive all of it, including even those unsaid hints and, and guesses about what might be left unsaid, to absorb them, to interpret them, to honor them, and then to be moved by them, and to be moved by them to action. So this is what we called narrative medicine. And as we mentioned previously, we're going to be using a lot of qualitative data throughout this presentation, um, using the voices of bereaved parents to explain each concept. And this is a quote that came from a study um, where a mother speaking about her daughter's death and how the principles of narrative medicine help. And it reads, my daughter waged the toughest battle of her life, but died of cancer in the middle of her 13th year. How does a mother cope with so tragic a loss? I told and retold the story. I talked about how we faced the chemo, the pain, and the fear together, about the final days on the wish trip, about her death. I shared with all who would listen, and gradually, the storytelling helped me to make sense of things, to cope with the gaping hole in my world, to find a new normal for myself, to move on. And though this quote 
talks about storytelling with anyone and everyone who would listen. In our literature review, there is a lot that points towards the how meaningful it feels for bereaved individuals to discuss their story and feel heard in discussing it with the medical providers who understood their child's physiology as intimately as they did. And so we're gonna look into step one, which is learning the narrative of AA. And first we'll begin with the team's perspective. So AA was a 17 year old girl who had recurrent medulloblastoma. And it had been diagnosed eight years ago and had multiple recurrences. And so she had undergone surgical treatment and multiple episodes of, or multiple uh, treatments of radiation therapy. In the context of clinical decline, in May of 2018, she underwent, uh, or she had an MRI, which showed extensive, uh, extensive complications of her prior surgeries and radiation therapies, including necrotic brain tissue um, and uh, vasculitis uh, and areas of stroke. As her, uh, and there was no, uh, no evidence of tumor regrowth or new tumor growth. In August, with continued clinical decline, she underwent another MRI, which was consistent with the one that was in May. And then further clinical decline in October at the point of respiratory failure, another MRI was performed, at which point the team was quite surprised to see that she had a very large tumor that was uh, impinging on her brainstem and uh, causing uh, brainstem herniation, which uh, causing um, which uh, is a very um, dangerous thing that can happen to a child or anyone's brain. And they said to us, she's dying, and her parents, they just don't get it. So the interdisciplinary pediatric palliative care team met with the family to hear their narrative and to learn their story. Um, and through our conversation with them, they brought with us and shared that um, they really could only see three ways in which this tumor could have happened. Um, first being that the team must have lied about the MRI in August. The second, that the team was wrong about the, M the August MRI. And the third reason being that something caused the tumor to grow between the MRIs. And the family shared with us that although um, they've had such great experiences at this hospital and they trusted the medical team, and because they were so fantastic and honest that they couldn't have lied about the MRI in August, and that also means the team couldn't be wrong about it. So the only option that the parents saw was that something must have caused the tumor to grow between the MRIs. And this was their story that they shared with us. And in trying to explore this option uh, further with them, uh, they continued to name various things that had changed in um, AA's medical care uh, between the two MRIs um, and kept saying, you know, maybe if we reverse this or that um, and really delving into all of the details they could think of that could have possibly caused what seems impossible to be possible. And their thought was, and they kept saying, if we just figure out what it is, and if we can just reverse that thing, then she'll go back to the way she was. So if we're looking at the bereavement risk factors before the interdisciplinary pediatric palliative care team's involvement, um, as we can see, um, AA's tumor would result in a death from a medical complexity. Additionally, it's important to know that this family had concurrent stressors. Um, they were an international family and had six children living at home in their country um, that were being cared for by other family members. And as such, they had limited social supports here in the state. Um, and on the protective side, they did have a very strong spirituality and faith faith that provided them support as they were caring for their daughter at the end of her life. And with the narrative being the way it was, they were at risk of all six modifiable factors leading to, uh, complicated, uh, leading to complications mm -hmm. in their bereavement course. 
So after we learn the family's narrative, any effort we try to discuss the big picture using everything in our clinical toolkit that we've learned throughout this fellowship year was blocked by a question regarding a small detail, such as what about her BiPAP mask or what about her PIC line? And eventually the family asked us to stop visiting as the only team that they wanted to discuss the big picture with um, was the international office since that was the only team um, that had the means to help get their daughter back home if it was medically possible. And so in this case for AA and her family and her team, we were able to complete step one and we were able to learn and hear their narrative. And with that, um, we were able to also determine that it was quite firmly fixed within the details for them. Um, and so uh, in our explorations with the family, um, it seemed that this was an element of their coping um, with their child's impending death. And so our goal became supporting the medical team. Um, and we explained that narrative to the medical team um, and worked with them um, as, as frequently as possible to provide AA and her family with the best possible care that they could. And that concludes case one, um, the case of AA in which we relied on principles from narrative medicine. And now we're gonna be moving to our second case, the case of BK, we'll be pulling from principles from narrative ethics. So there are multiple different definitions of narrative ethics um, in the medical literature. Um, and so the definition that we would like to discuss today is, is here. Um, each clinical case, or it states that each clinical case is unique and happens to a single identifiable person who is the protagonist in his or her own unique life story. It fleshes out principles so that we can see moral dimensions as embedded in the flow of people's lives and values. This helps us to recognize decisions that fit with people's lives as they live them. In other words, in any clinical case, what is right or wrong is, is dependent on how that decision fits within the narrative of the protagonist of that narrative and how it is that they perceive that decision will fit within their life story. And in our next slide, we're gonna be showing a video again of a bereaved set of parents. Um, this was on the Courageous Parents Network's website, um, illustrating how narrative ethics affected their son's clinical trajectory. Swallow studies because we knew his swallowing was going away. The study was only telling us that it was only giving quite frankly school systems ammunition to why he couldn't do something instead of us which is he can still do something and so we just stopped we stopped having them there wasn't there wasn't a purpose that was making his life better unless we wanted to choose a feeding tube and that's a different conversation than just a swallow study i mean we knew he was aspirating. We knew we needed to puree everything. We knew we needed to modify how we were feeding him. We didn't need a test for him to have to go through that. It was actually such a perfect use of palliative care to essentially to create a space where you can examine what next steps are. And YouTube came already with a language about talking about that. A, a philosophy of care. You were you were very clear that you wanted to do those things that would help the quality of his life. I thought that was something you helped us with a lot was to be able to translate our philosophy into a language, into a conversation with the medical field on how we wanted to. And that brings us back to the case of BK. Um, so BK, in hearing the narrative from the team, was a 25-day-old baby boy with a significant genetic condition that affected many of his organs, most significantly his heart and his brain. 
and asked for the family's OB history. BK's parents had four living children, but had experienced two pregnancy losses prior to BK that were unfortunately lost um, secondary to the same genetic condition that BK has. Um, and due to this, the family experienced significant distress and what they named to be suffering and had two tombstones put in their family's grave site um, to represent these losses. Um, as for BK's prenatal course, it was healthy. The family had um, concurrent medical care, attended every appointment, and there was nothing with this pregnancy or that the medical teams told them that indicated anything would be wrong um, or there would be any medical complexity in BK. Um, and as for the neonatal, neonatal course, after BK was born, he was found to have low oxygen levels as well as have those heart and brain abnormalities that I previously shared. Um, but at a follow-up visit, he was found to be in heart failure and had weight loss and as such was admitted to the NICU where the team reached out to us saying, she is BK's mom threatening to leave with the baby. I told her we'd be forced to call DCF for the Department of Child and Family Services. So when we uh, got to the NICU and met BK and his parents, uh, they were very clear. They knew that they were at risk of having children with the specific genetic anomaly. And they knew that all children and all people are at risk of receiving what they call bad medical care, especially people who have medical complexity. And they felt so proud of the six prior pregnancies that they were able to make decisions that could protect um, their children from the what they called bad genes and the risk of bad medical care. And so their frustration came um, with this prognostic uncertainty that really weakened the parental uh, protective shield that they had previously felt so proud of. Um, and so they felt that with that prognostic uncertainty, their child, BK, was suffering because of their bad genes and because of the, again, what they called bad medical care that they weren't able to protect him from. And since we completed step one, it's important that we move on to step two, which is understanding the family's decision making. Um, and that is that it was important to BK's parents to have the information available about his prognosis so that they were able to make decisions and goals on his behalf um, and again, protect him from future suffering and any suffering he might experience. Um, so their response and their decision making was that I don't want any procedures. I don't want any indicated medical interventions in this moment until you can tell us what's going on with him um, with his complexities so we can make goals on his behalf. And additionally, the family said, I want to take my child home again in an effort to protect him from any future suffering. And now that we, uh, we all have met BK and his parents, in thinking through their bereavement risks, um, BK also with his genetic condition um, would qualify as a death from medical complexity. This parent, these parents uh, did have multiple concurrent stressors, including financial instability. Um, and they did have also history of psychiatric disorders. Specifically, BK's mom shared with us uh, her history of trauma and uh, prolonged grief. Um, and then in terms of protective factors, they uh, reflected on very strong friends and family back in their neighborhood who were actually the people watching their four children um, as they were here with BK and also a strong uh, feeling of faith um, in their Christian background. And if we take a look at the six modifiable factors, if the case stands where it is, all six um, would serve as risk factors for complicated bereavement experiences after BK's death. And so when we learned about uh, BK's parents' narrative and came to understand why it is that they were so passionately asking to go home and so passionately declining further medical care, um, we uh, approached the NICU um, and explained to them what the thought process was and uh, why, why it is that uh, they were making the decisions that they were making. Um, and with that, the NICU felt that they were ready to support the family um, and were also ready to partner with us 
in the, the next step. And the next step was reaching out and collaborating with the genetics team who are able to um, collaborate with us and align with BK's parents and share with them the prognostic information that they were so desperately seeking, um, most specifically that BK would not have the ability to walk. He would not have the ability to talk, eat, or basically live his life independently due to the complexities he was experiencing. And this information was so key to the parents making the decisions and loving goals on his behalf. And they decided that based on this information, this was not a quality of life um, that they wanted their son to have. So they decided to make the loving decision to take their son home with hospice services where he could be comfortable, where he could be cared for and loved by his siblings and parents forever long he had left. And so in this case, we were able to accomplish step one, learning the narrative and step two, understanding the decision-making. And in doing that, we were able to partner with the NICU and with the genetics team in an effort to communicate or support them in communicating with BK's family in the way that they uh, felt would make a difference for them. And so um, though we weren't able to change uh, their impressions from their prior experiences, we were able to help them start a new chapter um, in which both the family and the medical team were able to uh, see the forest um, and uh, approach BK's care um, from a big picture goal-directed perspective. And in this new chapter, we were able to help move three of the modifiable factors to serve as protective factors for their bereavement risk after BK's death, most specifically being the confidence in the decisions that they were making, having support from the team um, and all of his care providers with the loving decision that they made, also feeling prepared for their son's death, as with the hospice community-based services, they would be well supported. And lastly, they were uh, secure in their role as caregivers for BK, as they knew that they did everything they could to protect him from suffering, to ensure that his life was one of comfort and love. And that's the conclusion of case two, um, where we use principles of narrative ethics. And now we're gonna be moving on to our last case of the day. Um, case number three, the case of SG, we're gonna be using principles here from narrative therapy. Um, so narrative therapy comes from the background of psychotherapy, social work, and mental health literature, um, and it's defined as supporting an individual and in making sense of their experiences through a medium that resonates for them. And it incorporates a respectful, non-blaming approach, with the primary focus being people's expression of their life stories or events in order to support their emotional processing and coping um, with what they've experienced in their life. And in our effort to demonstrate how the principles of narrative therapy or steps three and four uh, can help with uh, individuals in coping with uh, their uh, loss, um, we have a video on this next slide of, once again, bereaved parents sharing um, their experience. Not, <laughs> never feel first, but, uh, but we kind of had started to shift are thinking about what her life was going to be and how if this is what it is what are we going to do in this time and how are we going to do it and then we also had seen the or i'd seen and showed you some of the courageous parents network um, videos and so when dr mccauley came and asked us again the question of like well what do you hope for i think we had just i don't know we just had a different perspective i don't know if that's the right word no i think that, yeah, that's absolutely the right word um I don't know because it's it's we had we had a whereas before we were had things that our hope was things we were running away from hope was things we were wanted to avoid and then when as we kind of got more into it we had kind of more of a well hope these are the things that we want these are the things that we're running towards for for Emerson um, and so I think it was yeah it was a it was a sh it was putting ourselves kind of more in like a, a driver role about what we wanted, what we wanted for her out of this, not what we didn't want. And I think that would... And in case it was hard to hear, um, the, the, what they uh, attributed that shift to was conversations with their various clinicians and other parents. Mm -hmm. 
So now we're going to learn step one for SG, and we're going to start by learning the narrative of the team. SG was a two-year-old girl who had trisomy 18 with multi-system involvement. Most clinically significant for her was her ventricular septal defect um, and with bidirectional flow, uh, which is a cardiac or a heart anomaly, and chronic respiratory insufficiency. Um, and SG had been uh, doing quite well until she was admitted after contracting influenza virus, um, and she was in the ICU for a period of time with respiratory failure, ultimately improving, and she was able to go home. After being home for a week, uh, she once again developed respiratory distress, which uh, progressed to respiratory failure, uh, resulting in a readmission um, to the ICU. And uh, we, we received a call from the team saying, we're doing everything we can to balance her pulmonary and systemic flow, but her parents are so angry with us. So SG's family is a family with whom the interdisciplinary pediatric palliative care team had worked with um, for many years. Um, so when we approached them at this readmission, they shared with us their perspective that it shifted um, from previously held before and that they didn't feel like they advocated enough a few days ago as she had that acute readmission and they worried that um, they could have done more to keep their daughter safe and healthy. Um, and if they had advocated that she wouldn't be in the position that she was today. Additionally, they shared worries about how the team caring for her in the ICU setting didn't understand her anatomy like her continuity providers did. Um, and because of that, their narrative that they shared with us was that their daughter was sicker and experiencing unnecessary pain, which is why they were asking no providers to enter the room. And that brings us to step number two, uh, understanding their decision making. And so when we got to the ICU after receiving that call, we saw both of SG's parents standing at the entryway to her ICU room, um, asking that no provider or clinician um, enter her room. Um, and uh, in exploring this with them, they said, well, her heart is very, very fragile. And her cardiologist always told us, her parents, um, that, uh, that the best thing to do is to do as little interventions as possible. And so um, this team, they don't know that, and we just want them to let her get better the way she always does. And so for taking a look at the bereavement risk factors before uh, the involvement at this admission, this is a family that had concurrent stressors as one of the parents was at risk for a future job loss and did have another child at home. And additionally, um, SG's complexities qualified um, to be a death from medical complexities. And as for the protective factors, this was a family, again, that had strong social supports and strong spirituality and faith um, that gave them strength during the time of this admission and in caring for their daughters. And with the narrative staying the way, it, it should the narrative stay the way that it was, um, they would be at risk of all six subjective or modifiable factors uh, to serve as risk factors in regard to their bereavement, of course. Mm -hmm. And so for looking at step three, um, where we're gonna be reframing the perspective and partnering with the family, um, what we did is reach out to SG's continuity providers um, and shared their thoughts and their worries about how they felt they didn't advocate enough a few days ago. Um, and because of that, the primary teams were able to reflect back to the parents and recognize the beautiful work they did in caring for their daughter and said, she lived this long because of you. Remember that time when um, we only thought she would make it a week. And uh, the cardiologist also came to the bedside and offered, we always knew there would be a time when her heart would be too weak to keep sustaining the flow to both her lungs and her body. And gradually, um, both the, her, her continuity providers went from making statements to help families remember, or to help her family remember um, their prior narrative, to offering them suggestions and asking questions so that they could start to think about things in the way that they had previously thought about things. Um, phrases such as, her face is so relaxed, does she look comfortable to you? 
Remember that time when um, we only thought she would live a week after her birth? Um, do you want to hold her? She loves being in your arms, right? Has she always been this strong? And because of this and all the work that we had done um, on the interdisciplinary pediatric palliative care team with the primary providers and the continuity providers, the parents were able to regain um, and come to know um, this new narrative that was reframed and that she lived longer because of us and her medical teams. And now it's time for her to rest in peace. And in having completed step one, step two, and step three, um, we were able to have an uh, impact on uh, the parents' narrative and the team's narrative in terms of uh, helping them shift their focus from the details, which for the parents are sort of the, the details about what each intervention was doing to her blood flow. And for the medical team, um, the details of her parents' emotional state and responses to them. And instead, both the family and the medical team were able to align in thinking about SG as the beautiful girl that she was um, and uh, helping her to experience the best final moments that she could. So if we're revisiting the bereavement risk factors after the interdisciplinary pediatric palliative care team's involvement, you can see here that due to our work and our partnership with both the teams and the families, that all six of the modifiable factors were, be, were able to serve as risk factors um, for the parent's bereavement experience after their daughter's death. And step four is a longitudinal process and that is preserving the protective narrative and again relies upon principles of narrative therapy. And narrative preservation and maintenance, um, we searched in the literature and it's defined as clinicians reinforcing patients and their families' reauthorship of their life stories and allows for these patients and their families to continue preserving their preferred identity in a reconstructed future. But overall, our goal with this step is to reinforce the parents or caregivers' roles as the loving and dedicated caregivers that they are. Um, and this can be done as a child is approaching their end of life throughout the whole course of the illness trajectory, as well as with ongoing bereavement support after the child's death. And this is a quote from another qualitative study uh, in which a bereaved parent discusses how uh, they felt in having discussions with the palliative care team uh, after their child's death. I did and still do second guess some of the decisions we made. I'm so thankful to your team for your honesty and for reminding me why we made the decisions we did. And so for step four for SG, there were two parts. Um, the first was in the uh, hours leading up to her death making sure that any provider who interacts with her and her family is aware of the goals and aware of the uh, current state of her health and her life. Um, so as not to say anything that could um, cause uh, her parents to um, lose the sense of understanding of her narrative and her health care. Um, and so uh, that also meant uh, actually providing some suggestions to clinicians um, like residents and bedside nurses who felt, um, uh, who expressed discomfort. And, you know, what, what is it, sh what should I say? What should I do? Um, so phrases like she looks so calm in your arms or you did the right thing. And the second phase of preserving the protective narrative occurred after SG's death, death through the ongoing bereavement support. Um, so that is where we used our uh, bereavement phone call outreach, ongoing support and availability and mailings um, to again share with SG's parents um, how we'll always remember what strong parents that they are and that we're still here for you even though your daughter has died. And with these factors um, and with these steps, we were able to protect the narrative um, and cement it. Um, so the parents had that ongoing picture that she lived longer because of us and her medical teams, and now she's resting in peace. And that is a narrative that was solidified through our work. And so uh, that, that brings us to the end of case three. Um, and as we sort of 
reflect on all three of those cases and the four steps, um, we hope that you can use this table to sort of reflect on those patients that you were thinking about uh, throughout the course of this talk. Um, and so, like we said, um, none of these steps are groundbreaking. They're all things that we've learned. Um, but having them in this uh, order, as well as with um, the things that we've learned through our literature review about narrative medicine, narrative ethics, and narrative therapy, um, we hope it might change the way that you uh, use these phrases and um, the way that you think about the information that they provide you. So in drawing upon principles of narrative medicine and using step one when we're learning the patient's and family's narrative, um, I like to ask questions. And what I've been taught throughout this fellowship year is to ask, tell me a little bit about your child and leave it open-ended so we can let the family kind of share their thoughts and feelings and describe their child, how they see them in this present moment. For step two, understanding decision-making. One of my favorite things that I've learned this year um, is uh, hearing a question and then not making assumptions as to what that question means to the person who's asking it. And actually trying to understand, can you tell me a little bit more about why it is that you're asking that question? And then looking to step three, um, if we're drawing upon principles from narrative therapy to help reframe the perspective using complex reflections that we've been taught throughout our uh, communication curriculum and also asking parents and families, I'm hearing that you're telling me this about your child. Is that right? And allowing them to either say that, yes, you're hearing me correctly or no, actually, this is actually how I'm interpreting the situation. And finally, for step four, preserving the narrative. Um, one of the things that we've learned this year from our work with the interdisciplinary team at Children's and Dana Farber um, is the importance of having discussions with staff, um, especially when the staff seems to disagree uh, about the best next steps and making sure that the family is um, seeing us as a united front in an effort to continue their ability to make sense of everything. Um, and of course, the work through bereavement calls and visits. So if we look back to the cases of AA and BK, where we weren't able to progress through all four steps, um, we do need to recognize that these are some of the most difficult cases that we as palliative care clinicians um, will face. And we may be left asking ourselves, should I have done more? Could I have done more? What could I have done differently to impact these parents, this child's end of life, and their ongoing bereavement experience? And with that, it's important for us to remember as clinicians, um, and not just the palliative care clinicians, but all clinicians caring for these cases, that our narrative is important too. And it is very easy to get stuck in those questions and in those details, trying to figure out what we could have done differently to better support a family or a team or a child. Um, and so we, uh, we, thought that another um, good use of these four steps could be to help enhance our clinical experiences um, in making sure that we're able to see the big picture um, and maintain our resilience as clinicians each day. So for step one, after having um, a difficult interaction or any interaction at all with a patient or a family, relying on the principles of narrative medicine, asking each other, how do you think that went for you? Or how do you think that went for the patients to hear our own stories? And if you hear or see a colleague um, you know, feeling confused and uh, second guessing things, trying to understand their thought process and their decision making and how their narrative of the clinical encounter affects those things. So why do you think it is that you feel that way? What, what do you wish would have been different? And lastly, looking to step three and step four, drawing upon the principles of narrative therapy to reframe the perspective and preserve that narrative, asking questions such as, what do you think went well in that interaction? Or what do you notice about the team around you? And lastly, having that consistent messaging in all discussions about the patient and family care. In an effort to continue to reinforce the narrative that helps us feel um, like 
uh, like we've done the best that we can within the circumstances available. So thank you so much um, to uh, many people who helped us put together this presentation. And thank you so much to everyone over there on the Dana-Farber children's side, um, specifically the Pediatric Palliative Advanced Care Team members, fellowship leadership, our amazing co-fellows, and AASGVK, and the countless other children and families who make each day worth it. So we have our select source references here. Um, and have multiple references in case anyone is interested. I'm sorry, sorry. I was supposed to delete those slides. <laughs> Did it? Um, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Uh, for taking the time to listen. Um, and we would be happy to answer any hear questions any if there is time. Answer any questions. Thank you both for an incredibly thoughtful and um, uh, beautifully choreographed presentation and a great representation of uh, interprofessional education and work. Um, are there questions here? Thank you. That was really wonderful. Um, one thing I think that is worth emphasizing, because all of your three cases, you got involved because of conflict. Mm -hmm. And when you think about narrative, arcs, conflict is kind of an essential component. And I think too often doctors, I think palliative care doctors handle conflict obviously generally better than most doctors, but it's interesting to me how, how many doctors run away from conflict instead of seeing it as an opportunity to you know, get involved and get integrated and, trend, and change the arc of the story to have an impact. Uh, and so I think that was really beautiful the way you uh, ex explained all that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question concerning when there might be a need for a difficult or bad side chapter. And it refers to your slide when you said the aunt comes in and says, it would have been better if you had. And maybe she's right. So in those situations where there is that need for dealing with some guilt, um, do you have a way of thinking of that narratively of like, okay, we need this side chapter where we're going to have some reconciliation to try to get back to your, your, your flow of narrative wants to look very pretty, mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's some ugly chapters too. How Absolutely. do you do that? Absolutely, yeah. And I think that was, we were trying to illustrate that a little bit with the second case. Um, because there were elements um, of the weeks prior to us meeting BK and his family um, where there were, uh, what was your phrasing, ugly chapters. Um, and so uh, we did a lot of work in sort of helping the family uh, uh, see that for what it is. Um, and uh, we sat with them and helped them process it and um, helped listen to what their experiences were and validated those things um, in an effort to uh, help them move forward um, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, getting um, stuck within yeah, the trees. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. within, within that um, bad or ugly chapter. Yeah, and we can also draw upon the principles from narrative therapy. And although we might be able not be able to change the situation that the child presents or that the family presents, because we can't control, um, again, relying on the principles of narrative ethics, how people make their decisions and um, bring their perspectives into the conversation. But as Zena was saying, we can use those principles to kind of reframe and validate and do our very best to shift those six modifiable factors to serve on the protective branch. Thank you for your question. I want to see if there are any questions over at Children's Dana Farber. Okay. Uh, two short ones. How strong is the evidence that spirituality and faith are protective? And there, as there was no discussion of spirituality or faith in your narratives, how, how do you work that in? So I think for the purpose um, of our presentation, we kind of exemplified these cases to kind of go through the four steps. But for each of these families, spirituality and faith did uh, serve as a really strong support. 
um, but we did want to just highlight those four steps. But in through our extensive literature review, it is such a strong support and a strength to families, particularly in end of life situations. But we also do recognize that not every family is going to be grounded in their spirituality and faith. And it's our role as the interdisciplinary uh, pediatric palliative care team to align with the family, um, to recognize their strengths. For some, it's spirituality. For others, they might have different strengths in other areas and places where they find support to align with those and to bring them out as much as we can and support them in amplifying those. And what the literature does show about that is um, the spirituality and faith can really serve as a source for um, being able to make sense of something that might not otherwise make sense or provide meaning to something that might otherwise be difficult to find meaning in. Um, that it makes sense that it would, but in a, there's a, a paper in adults where mm -hmm. prospectively uh, spirituality was prospectively measured, and the higher it was, the more time you spent on a ventilator in the days before death, and the, the longer your ICU stay. Thank you for sharing that. Spirituality, and spirituality is protective. Um, but religiosity uh, may not be. Um, this is a paper several years ago. I don't know the reference. But um, so I think it's important to distinguish religiosity from spirituality. Just in the interest of time, I know because sometimes we have people after I'm going to wrap up. But thank you both very much for a really thoughtful presentation. Thank, thank you. you.